Hello, lovely internet strangers. I know I've been gone for a while. I hope you haven't missed me too much. I am back and I will do my best to stay back. I just got a little bit distracted by life. I'm sorry. I am happy to bring you the next installment of an anti-feminist reads the feminist canon and also the anti-feminist canon. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, today I am discussing the first title in what I call the anti-feminist canon. For those of you who are new, this is a series where I read books about feminism, women's rights, gender relations, etc. And that includes anti-feminism, a topic close to my own heart. I couldn't find an anti-feminist canon list on the internet, so these books are entirely of my own choosing. And we're going to kick things off with The Fraud of Feminism by Ernest Belfort Bax, which was published in 1913. Yes, you heard that right. As to why I chose the book, I think the title says it all, and it was the earliest book I could find that explicitly argues against feminism. Not against women, but specifically against the ideology of feminism and feminist activists. As for where it sits in the feminist timeline, this book was published seven years before the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, but the author is British, and in the UK, women didn't get the right to vote at age 21 until 1928, although some older women did have the vote prior. But the women's suffrage movement in the UK was well underway. It had come together back in the 1870s. And this book was written well before The Second Sex, which was published in 1949, which is probably the first text in the true feminist canon. So who is the author Ernest Belfort Bax? It's quite a name. He was an English barrister, as well as a journalist, philosopher, historian, and a socialist. But don't hold the socialism against him. I promise you he knows his shit when it comes to feminism. Bax was also an advocate for the social and legal rights of men. He saw them as lacking in comparison to the legal rights of women. And in The Fraud of Feminism, Bax uses his extensive experience as a barrister to show how the law favored women at the expense of men and boys. He was an active anti-feminist because he said feminism was failing to address inequities for both sexes evenly, and that the anti-man crusades happening in his time were responsible for anti-man laws being preserved and for new ones being passed as well. Bax wrote many articles on this topic, and he expressed the view that women's suffrage would shift the balance of power totally in women's favor, and his concerns about men's equality led to his interest in socialism, which he saw as a potential solution for men being exploited by the capitalist system. As for how the book is structured, this is different than the last book I reviewed, A Room of One's Own, which had a kind of stream of consciousness format. This is more a return to the style of two books I previously discussed, Women in Economics and Woman in the New Race. There's a clear thesis, and then each chapter elaborates on a different aspect of the argument. He starts with a historical overview, and then he lays out the main dogma of modern feminism in his day, and uses his extensive knowledge of the law from his time as a barrister to discuss the legal privileges of women. This is going to be a series of videos because this book is amazing, and there's no way that I could cover it all in one video. In this particular video, I will lay out his key arguments and some of his main supporting points. So get situated, get excited, and let me lay this all out for you. Bax's main purpose with this book was to simply expose the pretensions of the modern feminist movement to track down the false statements that were repeated over and over by feminists. Because, as he says, quote, it is by this kind of bluff that the claims of feminism are sustained. That is, it's not that they're correct, it's just that they make their point over and over and over and no one refutes it. He is addressing male feminists with this book because he says that female feminists are entirely too biased to be convinced. Because I'm sharing the author's ideas about what was going on in his time, unless I specifically say otherwise, when I'm talking in the present, I am referring to 1913. And when I refer to modern feminism, I'm referring to feminism in Bax's day in the early 1900s. However, as you will find as we go through this video, pretty much everything he says applies to current current feminism as well. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So the crux of his argument is that there are two sides to modern feminism. There is the political side and the sentimental side. The political side is concerned with demands for so-called rights. It presents, quote, political, judicial, and economic demands on the grounds of justice, equity, equality, and so forth as general principles. Bax says that their initial stated primary goal is getting the franchise. So even though its demands are not purely confined to the political sphere, it is still first and foremost a political movement. Then there is the sentimental side. And by sentimental, he is referring to, quote, sentiment unequally distributed. For example, you would be sentimental if you objected to flogging women, but not flogging men. Whereas if you simply oppose flogging for everyone, then you would not be sentimental. In other words, being sentimental in this sense means you are showing partiality. Sentimental feminism is concerned with giving women special privileges in the law on the basis of their sex, and further, not just what is written in the law, but how the law is 
administered. Sentimental feminism has no principles, but, quote, relies exclusively on the traditional and conventional sex sentiment of man towards woman. The sentimental side pushes the idea that women should be allowed to commit crimes without incurring penalties that are equal to the penalties that men receive. This idea has a strong influence in the court system. He says that there may be feminists that are purely political or sentimental, but you generally find both sides in one person, even though what the political feminists believe in is completely contradictory to the justifications for sentimental feminism. Although women are rarely found guilty of crimes, when they are, women pushing political feminism will still fall back on the sentimental claims as it suits them. Bax says that the current state of things is relatively new, that for most of history, men and women were punished equally under the law. It was not until the end of the 18th century that there was the first significant expression of the idea of changing the relative position of the sexes by changing the view of their worth. For example, when Mary Wollstonecraft wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Women. But this idea was not yet recognized in law. This sentimental side grew from the 18th century into the 19th century, and he gives an example of a law in 1820 in England that abolished flogging as a punishment for female criminals only, per the example I gave earlier, and he marks that as the beginning of the differentiation of the sexes in criminal law. And he says that since then, it's only moved further and further away from the principle of sex equality in favor of what he calls female immunity. Quote, at the present day, assuming the punishment meted out to the woman for a given crime to represent a normal penalty, the man receives an additional increment over and above that, according to the crime for the offense of having been born a man and not a woman. Bax discusses anti-man legislation, particularly pertaining to marriage, more on that in future videos, and he says, quote, the whole power of the state is practically at the disposal of women to coerce and oppress men. Remember, this was in 1913, so the justification from the sentimental side of feminism is a vague claim that women are physically weaker. Bax says they only claim this because it's the only argument they have to justify female privileges, although it doesn't really justify it because their physical weakness is muscular, but women are more resilient, resistant to disease, pain tolerant, they live longer, etc. And although the sentimental feminist wouldn't put it this way, women are essentially mentally and morally weaker. That's the implication of what they say, because the only way they can justify special, aka more lenient treatment, is if women can't be held as responsible for their actions, and that contradicts what the political side of feminism would say, which is that women deserve rights because they are the intellectual and moral equals of men. Bax speaks of a sex union among women, aka female solidarity sister. He says that it's almost impossible to get a woman to admit another woman has committed a wrong act. However, men don't have a sex antagonism toward women, and public opinion is heavily influenced by old world chivalry, quote, hence the terrific force feminism has obtained in the 20th century. He says that sentimental feminism is helped by the fact that men hate other men, but women don't hate other women. I think he was off about that because in my experience, women definitely hate other women, but I think he was correct in the sense that women will form a coalition with each other when it serves their own self-interest. He also points out that despite the anti-man attitude of the feminist movement, if the women's movement was not supported by men, then it would not have been able to make any headway. He speaks of the feminist tactic to say that any man who criticizes feminism is only doing so because he has a personal animosity towards women and that there are real or imaginary wrongs done to him by women, which is still something that feminists talk about today. They'll say, oh, well, you're criticizing feminism. You're clearly a misogynist. You must hate women. Who hurt you? Bax says, quote, the contemptible silliness of this method of controversy should render it unworthy of serious remark. And my only excuse for alluding to it is the significant sidelight it casts upon the intellectual caliber of those who resort to it and of the confidence or want of confidence they have in the inherent justice of their cause and the logical strength of their cause. Translation, feminists only use this tactic because they know they're full of shit. He just said it in a more badass way. Bax says the political feminists, who posit intellectual and moral equality of women with men, will deny the, quote, absence or at best the extremely imperfect development of the logical faculty in most women, the inability of the average woman in her judgment of things to rise above personal considerations, and, what is largely a consequence of this, the lack of a sense of abstract justice and fair play among women in general. He says feminists only deny this because it would be fatal to their ideology, and he says the feminist dogma is supported by a bluff, that this dogma is believed by people who believe themselves to be up-to-date and advanced, essentially 
woke. And he says it's interesting because the advanced people claim to use reason and to test their beliefs and ideas as opposed to the religious people. But the advanced man who would claim to be up to date has to swallow the dogma and digest it as best he can. Bax says, quote, he may secretly, it's true, spew it out of his mouth, but in public, at least, he must make a pretense of accepting it without flinching. So essentially what he's saying is the ideology isn't true, but because it is fashionable to believe it, if you deny it, then you are not with it. So it's in people's best interest to at least pretend that they accept it and therefore there is no public dissent, at least not among the educated and or upper classes. But I feel that over time and into current year, feminism has trickled further and further down the socioeconomic classes, unfortunately. Even though political feminists should oppose sentimental feminist goal of ignoring female responsibility on grounds that aren't really distinguishable from the old-fashioned idea that women are inferior to men, they don't. Sometimes you can get them to agree in a conversation about it, but practically or consistently, do they adopt this position? No. Political and sentimental feminists are in agreement on claiming female immunity on the ground of sex. Quote, a man murdered by a woman is always a horrid brute, while the woman murdered by the man is just as surely the angelic victim. Just look at TV shows that we have now, like Deadly Women and Snapped. He explains that the privileging of women is based on the current idea of chivalry, not the historical idea. Most people would say chivalry is consideration for weakness, especially physical weakness, but modern chivalry does not include deference to boys or men of below average strength, and women who are strong or athletes will still claim protections of chivalry, and it doesn't apply to relative weakness and defenselessness, i.e. men being disadvantaged in the courts. The public will tolerate awful punishment for men, but can't stand the thought of the same being done to women. Bax says that the current idea of chivalry is just sex, privilege, and favoritism. He says the meaning of the word has changed from its historical association with the virtues of knighthood. Bax describes it as a, quote, scarecrow in the field of public opinion used to intimidate all who refuse to act upon or who protest against the privileges and immunities of the female sex. He says that chivalry to Today is just another name for sentimental feminism, and that it will continue this way until a sufficient minority of sensible men have the balls, essentially, to stand up against it. Bax says that the combination of political and sentimental feminism is, quote, simply grotesque in its inconsistent absurdity. In this way, modern feminism would fain achieve the feat of eating its cake and having it too. And this quote reminded me of something Miley Yiannopoulos said in an interview with Dave Rubin years ago, the idea of women being simultaneously oppressed and oppressor, which he called quantum super state feminism, which is a phrase that has stuck with me. This fits right in with the phenomenon that Bax describes where when political and economic rights are in question, women are equal, but when a woman has committed a crime, all of a sudden she's a poor, weak woman in need of chivalry. Even though muscular weakness has nothing to do with your ability to tolerate punishment, women have a higher pain tolerance and being in jail doesn't require physical strength, it requires more of a mental endurance and resilience and constitutional strength. So modern sentimental feminism is saying, quote, to men, all duties and no rights. To to women, all rights and no duties. He says feminists use the idea of women's physical weakness to take away men's ability to defend themselves against women, as well as to exonerate women for all crimes committed against men. He says it would be different if feminists condemn physical punishment as inhumane for both sexes, but they don't care when that happens to men. They only care what happens to women, and they know that they can rely on public opinion to support them. Quote, with some cry of, what? hit a woman? And Bax says, why not if she molests you? Which back then just meant harass, not specifically sexual molestation. He presents the idea that modern feminists have pushed aggressive weakness, that women are encouraged by feminist public opinion to become aggressive in protecting their weakness and encouraged to turn their weakness into a weapon of tyranny against men. Even though in doing so, a woman has deprived that weakness of any justified claim to being considered or tolerated. When it comes to the things that feminists say, he says there are feminist lies and there are feminist fallacies. Feminist lies are false statements intended to mislead the public about women's legal position, and feminist fallacies are statements that are derived from feminist assumptions and biases, but they are not intentional acts of deception. So the things feminists say about women's legal status have to be lies because the people saying them are smart enough to know better, whereas some things that modern feminists say are just fallacies, and he counters those. One example is the claim that the wife is the only unpaid servant. Bax points out that servants who are lazy or do a bad job can be fired or docked pay, which is not true with the wife, and the economic economic advantages she receives from her husband are far beyond whatever the best paid servant is getting paid. Another example is the reason women have lower wages compared to men is because they don't have the vote, but he says this isn't true because men's wages have never been raised by voting for new legislation. The only thing legislation has done has removed the barriers to men forming trade unions, and this was started long before the vote. Bax says feminists will say that women have to obey the same laws as men, and because of that, women have equal claim to take part in making and modifying the laws. Therefore, suffrage is needed and 
and deserved. But in practice, as already discussed, they are absolved from the more serious consequences that men face when they break the law. Bax says falsehoods are really dangerous because of the psychological fact that if you repeat a lie often enough and are not contradicted, then it becomes an established truth by the mass of mankind. And in current year, that's why the myth of the wage gap still exists. Because if you say it long enough, people just assume it's true. And if you depict the only people who contradict you as idiots or ignorant or hating women, then your bullshit becomes the gospel truth. Then Bax presents the gynocentric theory put forth by Mr. Lester F. Ward. I'm sure anyone who's familiar with men's rights advocacy will be familiar with this work. Briefly, the gynocentric theory is the supreme importance of the female in the scheme of humanity and nature generally. More on this in the next video. Bax says of this idea of the, quote, sacrosanctity of women by virtue of their sex, quite apart from their character and conduct as individuals, scarcely dates back farther than a century, even from its beginnings to early 1800s. People will say that it's explained by the power of sexual instinct, but he asks why this change has only happened in the last three generations, and that he, in 1913, did not yet have a satisfactory idea about the psychology of the feminist movement. But it seems to him to be a case of, quote, social hypnotism of those waves of feeling uninfluenced by reason, which are phenomenon so common in history, witchcraft, manias, flagellant fanaticisms, religious revivals, and similar social upheavals, the belief that woman is oppressed by man and that the need for remedying that oppression at all costs is urgent, partly at least, doubtless belongs to this order of phenomenon. I think he might be on to something, folks. He says that rational argument does not seem to be able to touch the dogma of modern feminism, even if you show that the facts oppose their assumptions, that women are not oppressed but actually men are oppressed, that the existing law and the way it's administered is not unfavorable to women but on the contrary is horribly unfair to men, it doesn't matter, they'll still repeat the same fallacies. Your attempts will fall on deaf ears or, quote, they fall off the mind coated with feminist sentiment as water follows from the proverbial duck's back. In his final chapter, which he calls the indictment, he says feminism is a fraud in its general aim and its methods of controversy and practical tactics. It's based on false grounds because men and women are not equal in natural ability and that feminist aim is not equality but actually the reverse, that they want to bring about with the help of men themselves and using the force of the state, quote, a female ascendancy and a consolidation and extension of already existing female privileges. And he says that feminists use these two sides of feminism as it is convenient. That is, they will appeal to the theory of equal mental capacity of the sexes when it is a question of political and economic rights and advantages for women. But then they will appeal to the sentimental side, to the idea of the inferiority of the female sex, when it's a question of legal and administrative privilege and consideration. So his hope is that, quote, honest, straightforward men who have been bitten by feminist wiles will take pause and reconsider their position. So what do I think of this book? I thought this book was amazing. To answer the buy, borrow, bypass question, definitely buy this book. In fact, you don't even have to buy it. You can get the book through Project Gutenberg for free. But if you want to have a book called The Fraud of Feminism on your shelf, I don't blame you. The book is not that long. The language can be a little flowery, but it's pretty straightforward and it was a very enjoyable read, at least in my opinion. And he has some crazy stories in there about female criminals and women getting acquitted for crimes, which I will cover in a future video, so stay tuned. So do I agree or not? Do I think that he was accurate in his time? Do I think he's currently relevant? It's difficult for me to fact check everything he talks about because the cases he discussed would be difficult to track down, but he presents this information in a very straightforward manner and he was a barrister, so he knew the law. Your interpretations of what he presents can differ, but I think his presentation of the facts was accurate in his time. And as for its current relevance, I would say that it's still as accurate as if you wrote it yesterday. I think anyone who's familiar with this topic will clearly see the relevance in current year. Honestly, the way I felt when I was reading this book was the same way I felt when I read On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. I had to keep double checking that this was actually a book that was written over a hundred years ago because it was so accurately describing current conditions. To be honest, it's kind of depressing that not much has changed since this book was written in 1913. Bax was hopeful that men would make this stand against the repetition of these feminist falsehoods, but no, it's worse than ever and feminism has a huge amount of state control and feminist ideology has invaded every institution, most troublingly education, and I'm not sure what's going to happen to correct it. Jordan Peterson said in his conversation with Camille Paglia a few years ago that essentially he felt like reasonable women needed to stand up to their crazy sisters, but there are only a small number of female anti-feminists that are public about their beliefs. In the general population, most of them are trad con women who I don't really identify with or find to be very persuasive. And among public figures, there are only a handful of academics and YouTubers that I personally appreciate. I feel like most of us, myself included, fear 
fear putting their livelihoods at risk with such controversial opinions. But I really wanted to talk about this book because people have often said to me, okay, well, you don't support current feminism, but surely you support the early feminists, the original feminists, the idea of feminism at the beginning. It's just that it got changed. So the current version is crazy, et cetera, et cetera. And I would say, no, what I mean is that I'm an anti-feminist and that means yes, all feminism. That from the beginning, feminists have had this contradiction within their ideology that still exists today. On the one hand, women are exactly the intellectual and moral equals of men and they should have rights as such. On the other hand, they are physically weaker than men and cannot be held as responsible for their actions and they need special privileges because they are oppressed. So now I can present this book and be like, look, this is why I also disagree with early feminism. And literally nothing has changed at the core of most feminist ideologies as they exist today. And yes, there is more than one feminist ideology, but that is a topic for another video. This book explains basically why I'm an anti-feminist at my core. There are a ton of other reasons I have that are much more specific, but in general, this is why I am anti-all feminism, even the OG feminists, and that's what makes me more hardcore than a lot of non-feminist or anti-feminist women. Anyway, I just thought this book was super interesting and I wanted to share it with all of you, and now you don't have to read it because I did that for you. As I said, there will be more videos on this book, so stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe, and I hope to have more content for you very soon.